Good morning, everyone. Good to be back this morning. Uh, Nina and I took off last week to celebrate our anniversary. It was our 35th, and we thought that des uh, deserved at least a, a special trip. So we made the trip down to the beach and found out that it was about minus 10 at the beach uh, with the windshield, I believe. Uh, we, we thought we would be brave and... You know, we've come to the beach. We're going to walk this beach, you know, and enjoy ourselves. Get barefoot and let's just do it. And so, yeah, we, we didn't last long. We we come running back because the wind was howling and it was horrible. So, yeah, so, yeah nothing like a, a blanket and a cup of coffee on a balcony overlooking the ocean. So that was the ticket. Yeah, that's good. But glad to be back. And uh, we're going to open up this morning with uh, hymn number 146. Oh, how he loves you and me. this morning hope that you're doing well you know as we celebrate today of course today is what palm sunday right you know as we think about christ jesus riding into jerusalem you know with the palm branches waving and them shouting hosanna you know and everybody's excited and everybody's praising him and everybody's loving on him and then just a few days from then they'd be yelling crucify him what a week amen you know so today you know the last couple of weeks as we've been journeying towards Easter, we've talked about who? Judas. We've talked about Pilate. Last week, I hope you enjoyed as we went to the garden and saw our Lord there. Today, we go to the cross. All right? So I hope that... So what I ask you to do is, it's going to be emotional, just to prepare our hearts and our minds today, amen? The Lord would bless us and keep us on a very special day as we think about it, as we gather our attention and we head to Good Friday. Right. You know, I tell you, I say this every single year and I'll keep saying it as long as you have me here. But, you know, we should have a, an amendment, something where Good Friday is a national holiday. You know, we should not have to work on Good Friday. I, I, I think all of us as Christians should have our entire attention for the entire day focused upon the passion of the Christ and what he did for us on Calvary. Amen. It's that important. So what we talk about today is of the utmost importance, church. It's because of what Christ did at Calvary. You and I have forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I need it. I need forgiveness and mercy in my life, and he gives it to me in full abundance because he loves me. Isn't that wonderful? I'm so excited to be in the Lord's house today. Y'all get ready, amen. I'm ready. I've seen some songs we're going to sing. I'm ready to worship. I'm ready to praise the Lord. But I will say, uh, Kurt didn't mention this. I will. Uh, today is his birthday. So happy birthday to Kurt. Yeah. We missed y'all, but I also was I also found out today that you uh, did you go to McDonald's today? I can. Though. Yeah, you can get your free coffee. <laughs> yes. He gets his senior citizen discount today. <laughs> Remember, brother, you're not getting old; you're just getting older. <laughs> Think about that. You're not old, but you are getting older. Happy birthday, brother! I love you. Uh, it's good to have y'all back with us. But anyway, uh, happy birthday to Kurt. I do have a few announcements real quick, and then we're going to pray and get back to worshiping the Lord. <laughs> Loaves and fish packing will be Tuesday, April the 6th at 6 o'clock. And as always, we could use food. Uh, so if you can't come and, and, and pack on Tuesday, uh, next Sunday, go ahead and bring some food, uh, if you will. If you have any questions, you get with Sister Joyce on that. Uh, not Joyce, Joey. Not Joyce. Not Joyce. Joey. I can't see with my glasses on. 
here we go. But anyway, we always need food. And also, this was given to me. I know some of you would certainly know uh, this family, but Charlie Ballou's wife, Joyce Ballou, am I saying that right? Passed away and um, just a few days ago, and her funeral will be at some point, I don't know the time, but it will be on Tuesday in Winfield is what I've been told. So if that's something that you're planning on going to, just check the time and the date there uh, just to make sure that I'm right there. But anyway, so let's remember this family in our prayers as well. Let's go to the Lord right now and ask his blessings upon us. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, what a wonderful day, God, to be in your house, God, as we gather together as your children, God, in your house, God, to praise you and to worship you, God, as we focus our attention upon Calvary today, God. And Lord, in what transpired so many years ago on that day, God, and what it means for us today, God, I hope and pray, God, today that you would focus our attention on the sacrifice, God, that you made when you gave us your son, Jesus, God. But your word declares you did so because of your great, wonderful love that you have for your people. So today, God, we just praise you. I pray, God, that your spirit would reign, God, that we would feel you so strong in our soul today, God. That, Lord, that we could hear you clearly. God, help us remove all distraction. And, God, and gain more knowledge about that fateful day when you gave us Christ Jesus and when he died for this world. That we may have forgiveness. God, that we may have a relationship restored with you. And, God, for those of us today gathered together in this room, God, that have been saved by you, we simply praise your name. God, that we have that wonderful forgiveness, God, and we've got your grace and mercy in our life every day. God, we just praise you. Lord, I ask your blessings upon every need, Lord, and there are many, so many needs, God. I bring them before you. I pray, God, for healing and blessings upon them. Father, I thank you, God, that you're helping us as it relates to COVID, God. It seems like more folks are getting either vaccinated or things seem to be getting better. God, we continue to pray every day, God, that you would help us in our community, that you protect our church and our families, our, you know, those that we care about, Father. Lord, we just need you. It's so many aspects of our life today, God. And we thank you right now, God, that you hear us from heaven. And God, that we have your attention this morning. So, Father, I pray, God, that you'd have your way among your people. And we'll be sure to praise you for what you will do in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Red. 
and doing just fine. Yes. He's our living hope. That's our next song. Let's sing about that time back near the cross.
I have hardened a lot over the years. Well, not in this section, but <laughs> in my heart, I guess, in a lot of ways. You know, you just see life come and go, and you see things, and things are tough, and things are better, and things are tough, and things are better. And I'm not a real emotional person, but my goodness. When it comes to what Jesus did for us, it just tears me up to think about him hanging on that cross. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for what you did. Let's sing a couple of hymns toward that end. <clears throat> 141, the old rugged cross. Sing the first, second, and the fourth of old rugged cross. Yeah. 
Seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners bleeding, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Oh, how I love him, Savior and friend, how can my praises ever find him? song with you as the band members are coming down. The words of Christ on the cross, it is finished.
These were battlefields of my own making. I didn't know that the war had been won. Over there, I heard the king of Was mine for the claiming, and now praise His name. I am free. It is finished. The battle is over. It is finished. There'll be. Bible to the Gospel of John chapter 19 this morning. I'm going to take you this morning to Calvary and it may challenge some of you because if you do your study on crucifixion, what you will find is something that's very grotesque, it's very vivid. And it's hard to imagine and it's hard to think about. So you may be challenged a little bit today because it may get a little graphic. I'll be cautious with how I say things. But if you read historians from that time period, they will tell you in detail what transpired on many crucifixions. And it's hard to stomach. Okay. So, when we think of the cross, it's behind this scene. I tell you what, uh, when, I, when we get through with, um, where's Gary at? Oh, I tell you what, um, Dan, I want you to raise the screen up for me. Once, the, once this gets off here. Because we see it as a symbol of our faith. I have a necklace too. I, occasionally I'll wear it. It's got a cross on it. Sometimes I enjoy wearing it when I'm going casual, whatever. It's a symbol of who I am. I'm a blood-bought, born-again Christian. I'm not ashamed of it. I love it. It's who I am. It's in my yeah. DNA. You'll never take that away from me. It's a symbol of my faith. It reminds me of my Lord and Savior. But on that day, there was nothing pretty about it. It's hard to stomach. So today I want to take you to the day that they tried to cancel Jesus. All right, you with me? Let's go to the day that they tried to cancel Jesus. I'm going to read a good bit of verses because I don't want to shortchange the entire story. So I'm going to read John's entire account of the crucifixion. And I'm purposely going to leave off when they get to the tomb. We'll cover that next Sunday, Lord willing. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to leave you with a cliffhanger. We all know what happened. We'll stop there. But I'm going to read you the entire account in John's Gospel, chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 17 through 42 this morning. If I go a little over today, don't worry about it. All right? Let's just relax and see what the Lord has for us today. Prepare our hearts and our minds. Verse 17 says, And he bearing his cross went forth into a place 
called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him. The two other with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put on the cross in the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. What disdain they had for the Lord. Mm. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rent it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said they parted my raiment among them and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, which was John the beloved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold, thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, behold, thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record and his record is true. And he knowing that he said truth that ye might believe for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. They took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths. With the spices and the manner of the Jews is to bury, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never a man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. There is a phenomenon that's quickly sweeping through our country that's called the council culture. Y'all been hearing this phrase? It's disgusting. It's ridiculous. But it's happening among us. It's a mindset that demands that if anyone says or does something that someone else finds offensive, that person, not their ideology, not their thoughts or their concepts, but that person must be silenced and destroyed. That's what's happening today. And as a result, people have lost their jobs, their careers, their reputations. And, and, and some have even had their lives threatened. There's a mob mentality, it seems like, out there that attacks people, even for something that was done or said 20 or 30 years ago. We certainly see it happening to politicians almost daily. Candidates for the Supreme Court, actors, comedians, media types, business people. Now think about this now. Even cartoon characters and children's books. What on earth is wrong with Dr. Seuss? Green eggs and ham. Let's, let's just cancel it. Is this the best thing we got to think about today? Don't we have more important things than to go through a children's book and see if there's something that offends me? Grow up! If you get offended by Dr. Seuss and the Muppets, the Muppet, Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy, that offends. 
offends you? Where's Terry at? Terry, you know what my, my, my favorite Muppet is, brother? You know who my favorite Muppet is? Animal. He's the drummer. I love Animal. He's my favorite. How can the Muppets offend you? If you are offended by the Muppets, you are weak. You've got no grit, no spine. What is wrong with you? But that's what we're facing today. That's how weak people are. That you get offended by something that's something that's so ignorant as a cartoon. And you want to spend your life and your moment in your waking hours trying to cancel the Muppets. I love the Muppets. And Smurfs and Transformers and G.I. Joe and whatever else they're going to try to cancel. I love all of that. And certain, and if they ever, there will be a riot. It, and there will be a riot if they try to cancel Star Wars. Let me tell you. They try to cancel Star Wars. I'm on the front lines. I'm the commander in chief. Follow me. Follow me. I'm telling you right now. They face being canceled because somebody got offended. Now, that's not to say that there aren't people in this world at some point who should have been canceled years ago. I think about dictators, right? If we could have canceled when, when uh, Hitler started to spew his poison instead of uh, brainwashing an entire country, if they could have canceled him out really quickly, there would have been a lot of less bloodshed and millions of people would have had their lives saved if we would have canceled somebody like him. I'm okay with canceling a psychopath that's trying to lead this world into war. I'm okay with that. But this council culture today in 2021 seems to be driven by some type of self-righteous hatred. And that's scary to me. It's you say something that offends me and because I'm offended, I must cancel you versus just say, you know what? I disagree with you. It's okay to disagree with someone, but to ruin somebody over something that was said. That could be truth because you got offended by it. That's where we are in 2021, y'all. And it's scary. But I'm going to tell you this, though. The desire to destroy other people is as old as mankind is. Think about it for a second. Cain, back in the book of Genesis, first book of your Bible, Cain canceled Abel. Right? Joseph's brothers tried to cancel him. Jezebel tried to cancel Elijah, and it goes on and on and on, all through the Old Testament, all through uh, Bible history. But I want to tell you that no one has faced the council culture more than Jesus. Nobody. The cliche, there's nothing new under the sun, there's not. No one has faced the council culture more than Jesus Christ. It was the council culture that put him on the cross. It was the council culture that hated him so much because of what he said and how he challenged the establishment and the truth that he proclaimed. It was the council culture that got so offended by his truth that they had him killed for it. And when they nailed him to the cross, the council culture rejoiced because they thought that he had been finally canceled. But unlike others who have been canceled by culture, Jesus, this is important, Jesus wasn't a victim, okay? The attempt to destroy Jesus had been planned by God well before that. In fact, it's a major theme in the Bible. Peter preached in Acts chapter 2 in the early church. They wanted to make sure that it's not by man's hands that this was accomplished. But God had preordained for this to happen. Acts chapter 2 verses 22 and 23. Listen to Peter's Pentecostal sermon. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And now he has boldness and he stands up and he says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know. Him being delivered, listen, by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. What is he saying? Let's go to what and see what Paul says about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul writes, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Amen. What does that mean? The cross has been planned the whole time. Jesus' death was on purpose. And the council culture did exactly what God knew they would do. 
Y'all with me? This is a little deep. Now, y'all listen. He, they did exactly what God predetermined that they would do, and it was all part of God's ultimate design. He knew very well what Judas would do. You think Judas betraying Christ surprised the Lord? To pray, uh, surprise God Almighty? No, he knew just what he would do. He knew what Pilate would do. He knew what Herod would do. He knew what the Sanhedrin would do. He knew what Caiaphas would do. He knew what the Roman soldiers would do. He knew it all and he used it according to his grand, complete design to affect redemption for all of mankind. He took the wickedness of this world and he used it to effect change for every man, woman, and child who would ever trust and believe in what he did. That's the God that we serve. Amen. He knew it because of his ultimate foreknowledge. That's amazing. So with that in mind, okay, knowing that this was according to God's foreknowledge, that he knew exactly what was going to transpire, he knew exactly what they were going to do, and he used it. I want to, with all that in mind, I want to look at the four events that John records, okay? We know that there's seven instances where Jesus spoke on the cross. I'm not going to cover all uh, seven of those. I'm going to talk about the four events that John records. And let's challenge ourselves this morning and let's look deep into it and see what God wants us to know. Listen, you know, these they're in here, John records them for a purpose, for a reason, right? They're here because God wants them to be here. So let's look in these words. God wants us to see something. So when we first get into it, when you're looking at the scripture, and of course we've got, you know, there was Jesus hung on the cross for six hours on that Friday. So there's a lot that certainly was transpiring. So we get a few verses. But don't you find it interesting that the scripture that John, that God wants us to know a lot of detail about what the soldiers were doing with his clothes? You ever wonder why is that so important? If you say, well, it's because he's teaching us against gambling. Do you really think that's what was on God's mind at that moment in time? It's going to give us a lesson on gambling while Jesus is suffering and dying on the cross? No. That's not what his focus is. What is it? I'm glad you asked. You ready to be challenged? Because it's going to hurt some of you. It's going to hurt me. Okay? We're told that the soldiers gambled for Jesus' coat or his tunic. Okay? At the foot of the cross. Let me read the verses again. I'm going to read it from another translation so it's a little easier to understand. It says, When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four... Now, let me... Four parts. Let me slow down. I want you, let me slow down. Let me go back. I want you to put yourself there. Really think about what I'm saying here. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. His tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom, so it was valuable. Only thing that Jesus had of value to his name. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says they divided my garments among them. And for my clothing, they had cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. Do you notice that it says this was to fulfill scripture? OK, but why? Why would God have somebody in the Old Testament prophesy that they would cast lots for the garments of the Messiah. Why is that important? Way back then, hundreds of years before, but it's happening now at Calvary to fulfill Scripture. Why did God even bother to make this a prophecy? Why is this even important? Have you stopped and thought about it before? When you read through the, the story in, in, uh, of the cross, you think, why is this important to record? Just to get us all riled up because they're casting lots for His clothes? No. We're not told exactly, but you've got to use a sanctified imagination. I've got a pretty good idea why that it's in there. And here it is. Despite what you have ever seen in your life of the various paintings and the movies of Jesus being crucified, there is a 99% chance that Jesus was crucified naked. The Romans would strip you bare. That's a historical fact. That's a historical fact. 
I have studied it all week. And occasionally you'll find a scholar may say, no, I think he had a loincloth on. And the I, I, only reason I think that that person says that because he really wants it there to be one. And so do I. Why did they do this? They, when they crucified people, they stripped them bare and their intention was to cause as much possible suffering and shame as you possibly could imagine upon that victim. They, this included embarrassing their victims by exposing them and robbing them of any form of modesty or decency. We just sang about it. I don't know if you caught it. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, an emblem of suffering and what? Shame. Shame. I, I just can't get beyond it. I just can't imagine what a scene. You say, I just don't believe you, Sean. Okay. Believe what you want. But I know when Jesus was arrested, he didn't have nothing but the clothes on his back. The Bible says the soldiers took his garments and began to divide them among themselves. This is the most important thing he ever had was his coat. They said, well, let's don't do that. That's got value to it. Let's just cast lots for that. If you don't know what casting lots is, it's kind of like flipping a coin in our world, you know, to see best out of five wins. Or if y'all were, and really, I've seen artifacts of what they would use. And it reminds me, if you're old enough to remember the game Yahtzee. Anybody know what that is? You had a little little cup and you had a little dice in there and you'd roll it around and you'd throw it out there and whatever happens, happens. But they would have different stones and different colors and different sizes and shapes and that's what they would do. His tunic was valuable. To cut it up would be senseless so they gambled for it. Winner take all. But this, the question still comes to me. Why? Why would God prophesy about soldiers casting lots for his garments? Why is this important? To give us a lesson on gambling? You can make that lesson all you want to. That's fine. We can cut that out and we can have that for another sermon for another day. But I believe he wanted us to remember the, of the shame that Jesus Christ was facing. I cannot imagine the embarrassment. I cannot imagine... The indecency of it all, sitting up there on the cross, bleeding to death in front of his own mother. I cannot imagine it. It hurts my soul. It pains me to my core. To think the reason he did that was because of me. I don't know why he loves me so much. I told you, I don't know if I'm going to make it through today. Y'all may have to help me out. Kurt, would you give me some napkins, please? I don't have a handkerchief. Thank you. The second incident, I'm going to move on from that. I'm going to leave that there. You go home and read. Go home and study. Unfortunately, you're going to find out exactly what I found out. The second incident, we noticed that the cross was... Jesus taking care of his mama. Oh, man. This is a good one. He turns her over to John for safekeeping. Now, you can understand. I'm reading from the Gospel of John. You can see on a human level why John wants to put this in here. Jesus just entrusted Mary to his care. This is a great honor. This is a privilege for him. And he wanted to share it. I understand that. But nothing is in Scripture just because John wants it in there. Everything is in the Bible for a reason because God wanted it in there. So let's look at this. Why was this one of the only seven things that Jesus said on the cross? Why was this so important that it was recorded in perpetuity? There's something here that Jesus wants us to know. Now, I'm going to make some people angry, not in this room, but I would probably upset some of our Catholic friends. All right, and I'm going to upset them. That's fine. But the Catholic Church believes a statement, this statement by Jesus was to show how superior Mary was compared to others. And there's, if you, and there's a whole lot of history there with what they believe. But I have to tell you, I don't think so. I don't think this is why Jesus said it. First off, let me tell you two things. First off, Mary was a sinner like you and I. 
She was a fantastic person, but she was a sinful person just like you and I. Why, does I, why do I say that? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus needed him on that cross. I'm sorry, Mary needed Jesus on that cross just like you and I needed him on that cross so she may have forgiveness. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now she was honored. To be chosen as a woman that would take care of Jesus. The Bible says she was highly favored. I know that she was a very special young lady. And she was. She was chosen by God because she could be trusted to do what was needed to be done. Because it was a tough order. An angel comes and says, by the way, you're going, I know you're a virgin, but you're going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she says, be unto me as you see fit, Lord. I'll do it. She was this very special lady. Very special lady. But to be treated as a deity? No, that's not what Jesus wanted. And here's how I think that to be true. You ready for it? A little something different. You ready for it? All right. Have you noticed that there's two times that Jesus addresses Mary in the entire Gospels, twice. On the cross and at the feast, the marriage feast, when the wine was running out. Both times he called her woman. He didn't say mother. You ever notice that? You ever wonder? Why is it recorded he called her woman? Does everybody call their mother woman? My mother slapped me silly. If I go up to Linda the next time I see her and say, woman, fix me a sandwich. I mean, you're going to see my mother smack the fire out of me. Call my mother woman. <laughs> I don't recommend you try that to anybody, right? And when, and, and when uh, he's addressing her, uh, at the marriage, he says, woman, what does thou have to do with me? My hour's not yet come, right? That's how he dresses. I'm not making this up, by the way. I think they recorded these words to his mother. Mary recorded here at the crucifixion to remind us of two things. One, that Mary was the woman who gave birth to him, and it was Jesus' responsibility as the eldest son to make sure his mama was taken care of. And that's a fact, too. And he did. Up on the cross, suffering. 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 He shows that he loved his mama. He takes care of her. Make sure that I'm leaving. John, you take care of her. The Bible says that very day John took her in. What a place of honor for John. But secondly, I think Jesus also wanted to let us know that he was very careful to avoid maybe using the word. This is my sanctified imagination, possibly here. But I think he wanted to be careful that his mother would, now that he's leaving, that she would not be treated as some kind of deity to be prayed to and who might be seen as, and I'm quoting from the Catholicism book, that she is that she's surpassing all other creatures both in heaven and in earth. I don't think that was Jesus' intention. I'm going to tell you right now, she's a wonderful woman. I can't wait to meet her when I get to heaven. Wait to meet her when I get to heaven. But let me tell you something. She is not my intercessor. Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for you and I today. And it is Him who I pray to. I believe everything else is false. I'm sorry. I believe it's a mistake. I don't think there's any intention Jesus ever had for his mother to be some type of deity that we pray to and that she is the one who answers my prayers. Jesus Christ turns to the Father, makes intercession for me, and my heavenly Father answers my prayers. The next phrase. Oh, man. Y'all going to have to just hold tight. Y'all stomach growling? I've got through two of the four points. Y'all look like to hang on, y'all okay? I would apologize, but I wouldn't mean it. <laughs> the next phrase Jesus cried on the cross was, I thirst. Why is this important? Was Jesus thirsty? Of course he was. Let me give you something that's very graphic here. Jesus has been at the whipping post. It's hot from from the sweat and the blood that's ran down from the crown of thorns on his head, there's a very good chance that his, mouth, his tongue is swollen and that his mouth is caked. Uh, his lips are parched with dried blood and sweat. He can probably barely speak if you want to know the truth of it all. And all of us know if we just get a little hot cutting the grass, we can't wait to get some water, right? 
It was prophesied that this would happen. It was prophesied because God wanted us to know that his sufferings were real. But if you notice something in the other Gospels, this is interesting. That in Matthew and Mark's account of the, cru of the crucifixion, they tell us that there was a different time that he was offered this vinegar. Yes, but there was, uh, two there was a different time that he was offered something else to drink. And it was before the crucifixion. Did you know that? Matthew, he says that he was offered wine mixed with gall. Uh, Mark's account says it was wine mixed with myrrh. Have you studied that? Why is that and why? Why was he offered that before he was crucified? And some of you are looking at me like, that didn't, that's not, that didn't, that didn't really happen. Hold on one second. I'm going to go there right now and show you. Just because I want to. Because I, I know I'm going to run over. I don't care. Listen, Mark chapter 15. Verse 23. I'm going to go to verse 22. This is Mark's account. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments. It was before he was offered the vinegar. What is wine mixed with myrrh or wine mixed with gall? And why did he refuse to drink it? Well, upon studying this, Wine mixed with gall was to, and wine mixed with myrrh was to intoxicate. It was basically their version of a narcotic. And it was to allow that person to feel less of the pain of what they're about to suffer. So they gave that person an option to take this, and really it was kind of a poison. They're going to die anyway, so the soldiers don't care. If you want to take this, it will lessen some of that grief that you're going to experience. If you'll take this, Jesus refused it. He refused it. You can say, that's a lesson then against not drinking alcohol. That's not his intention here whatsoever. His intention was to feel all the pain and all the suffering. Because he told us before, that was my purpose. That's the reason in which I was born, was to suffer and die. And he was not going to take that away. That he was there to experience pain and thirst on our behalf. The wine and the myrrh would have removed the pain and the suffering. And Jesus refused to drink that liquid. So later on, he's been almost six hours. He's been hanging on the cross. Jesus knows that it's almost over. He's about to die. He says, I thirst to fulfill the scripture. They give him vinegar. Put it on his sock, put it on a sponge, put it on his sock, they put it up to him. He takes some. Why? He's about to die. Why now? Why take something now? Remember what I said? He can barely speak. His lips are parched, they're caked in matted blood. He clean, he gets his lips clean, wets his tongue. Why? Because he's got something really important to say. Kurt sang about it. Because the last thing that John records, Jesus says, it is finished. And he, in my mind's eye, Jesus wanted everybody to know it clearly. That he didn't want there to be any confusion about what he said. So everybody could hear clearly. He wets his tongue, wets his mouth, gets his lips where he can speak clearly. And he shouts, it is finished. And the Bible says he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. It is finished. What did that mean? It meant that his task was completed. Everything he had come to do, it was completed. It was finished. Someone had noted that this word, it is finished, in the Greek is tetelestai. What does that mean? Tetelestai is a legal term that meant that your debt has been paid in full. So if you owed somebody money back in that day, they would stamp that document, that, con that contract, they would stamp it with the word tetelestai. Paid in full. That's the word that Jesus used. Romans 6, 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Our sins came at a price. The price was our death. Or someone that was what Jesus did, church. To take our place. To pay the price. To die for our sins. 
And when Jesus did that for us, it truly was finished. The price of our sins have been paid, has been paid in full. And all we've got to do to accept this free gift today is to believe that He is the Christ. He is the Son of God who came to die for our sins. We need to acknowledge and repent and turn away from our sins. And if we will confess Him as Lord and Master of our life, we shall be saved and receive this forgiveness that has been bought and paid for. And on that day, glory to God, your sins will be completely abolished. Isn't that incredible? Amen. It's something to celebrate this coming Friday and every day. Now, all of that being said brings me back to the council culture. The council culture of our day doesn't forget your sins. You know, it don't matter how long ago or how obscure your past has been or what you did 50 years ago. Council culture doesn't care. That that sin's been forgiven, they will not forget. They'll find that sin, they'll do everything in their power to embarrass you with it. Y'all have seen this over the last year or two. I mean, it's, it's so ugly what someone will do to destroy another person. For people like that, there's no such thing as forgiveness. There's no such thing as mercy. And when you think about that, aren't they not kind of like Satan in a certain way? I read this and I liked it. Someone noted, I read, noted this. It said, Satan knows your name, but he calls you by your sin. I found that to be interesting. In other words, it doesn't matter how long ago you may have committed that sin. Satan's always going to be there to remind you over and over and over how you failed. His objective is always, has always been to counsel you, to destroy you, and to remove from you every hope and every dream. That's what Satan does. It doesn't matter how many good things you've done to erase the past, Satan will always bring it up time and time again. But I've got good news and I'm heading to a close. But once you're forgiving, things begin to change. Jesus makes it so that our sin debt is paid and paid in full. So while it's true, Satan knows your name but calls you by your sin. Once you're forgiven, God knows your sin but calls you by your name. There's an eternity worth of difference there. God knows your sin, but he calls you by your name. In other words, once you're forgiven, God doesn't know you by your sins. He knows you by your name. And when God forgives... He's the only one that can get that can forget those sins. I was trying to find an analogy, a little story to close based on that. And I'm reading this one because the first sentence caught me off guard. And I, I read it and I liked it. And the first sentence says, she was crazy. I went, oh, I got to read this. It says, she was crazy. And everybody knew it. Because she had the habit of talking to herself in public and it was known that she believed that she could even talk to Jesus and Jesus would speak back to her. She's crazy. So a new preacher came to town and hearing of this crazy woman thought he's going to fix it. He's going to give her some reality. So one day as he saw her walking down the street, he spoke to her and got around to ask her and says, you know, I hear you talk to Jesus. She said, yeah, Jesus and I talk for hours and hours. He said, will you do me a favor? Could you ask him something for me? Well, of course, she said. Would you ask Jesus what the last sin was that I confessed to him? She said, absolutely. I'll ask him tonight. The next day, the preacher saw this crazy woman down the street and he approached her and said, well, did you talk to Jesus last night? She says, oh, I surely did. What did he say was the last sin that I confessed to him? The preacher asked. Why? She said, he said he didn't remember. He didn't remember. When God says, I'll cast your sins into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought up before you again, that's exactly what God means. That's not just a picturesque story to make you feel good. When he says, I will remove your sins as far as the east is from the west. You know what that, that line is? That means infinity. Which means it never stops. It has no end. I will remove them as far as that is. Is what God said.
Curtis, come on up. Let's close this up. Trisha, come on up. I want to tell you, and those who may be listening to this message, that if you've never confessed Christ, and that's not complicated. I know that sounds complicated and it sounds very formal, but it's not. What I mean by that is if you believe in Christ, it's rare that I find anybody who doesn't, actually. That's a very rare thing. We don't like to talk about atheists and other people. I, I can't name you one atheist. I know a lot of people believe in Jesus, but don't follow him. Maybe they don't know how. Maybe if someone just told them, what is it? What is it, the ABCs? Admit, believe, confess. Children know it, don't they, ladies? Children know it. It'd be good for adults, too. Admit who we are. We're sinners who need saved. Believe in Jesus Christ. Believe in God's Son. Believe in what He did and confess Him. Which just simply means, Lord, I know who You are. I know what You did. Today, I'm going to make You Lord of my life. I'm going to follow You to the day that I die. And Lord, I know I ain't going to get it all right, but I know You're going to be with me. I know you're going to help me along the way. Today, you're my Savior, and heaven's my home from this day forward. In Jesus' name. I have prayed that prayer, and it changed my life. Amen. And now I have forgiveness, and I need it. What about you? I think about what Jesus did, and I think about how much I need what he did. And it blows me away. And I pray that that feeling in my life never goes away. I want to die being astounded by what Jesus did for me. I want to go to my grave being bewildered why he loves me so much. Because when my heart stops beating, (laughs) right away, I'm going to figure it out. Right then and there, I will figure it out. Because I shall see him. Face to face. Man. What a day. That's the Savior that we serve. This man, Jesus. He's not just something. He's everything. And as we approach Good Friday, my friends, my family, brothers and sisters in Christ, please stop for a moment and think about what really happened that fateful day. And stop right there in your soul and give God thanks for his sacrifice that he made. And the only reason he did is because he loves you so much that he would sacrifice his son instead of you being in hell for all of eternity without him. He would give his very best. Amen? Be so thankful. Let's sing a song. Stand to your feet. The altar is open if you need something earlier that I understand completely. You know, I, outside of this, I'm not a, much of a crier. I'm not. It's rare. That's just, I don't know why. But when I think about Jesus, my heart can barely contain itself.
I can't wait to meet him. One day I will. I'm going to fall on my face. And I'm going to worship him. Can't wait. It's a reality out there. I nearly can see it. I would spend time asking him why, but it won't matter. And how, it won't matter. I don't know what that's going to be like, church, but I can't wait to see it. And I'll have that privilege because he did what I could not do. And I thank God for him. Amen? Amen. I thank God for Jesus. Yes. Hope you have. I know we're 15 minutes over. I don't want to go over that long. Thank you for being patient with me. Hope that you receive something from the Lord today more importantly than anything. As we go forth this holy week, today's Palm Sunday. Friday's Good Friday. Sunday's Easter morning. And we're going to have a time. Amen? Amen. So have a wonderful, holy week. Be so mindful of what God has done for you this week. It will transform your life. Doesn't matter how long we've been in church. Doesn't matter how long we've been saved. This week can continue to change our life because of the absolute importance. It's not just something, it's everything for us. Allow God to do that and he will do that. Have a wonderful week. Brother Rick, dismiss us in a closing prayer.